Okay, and thank you all for coming. My name is Sandy Baird, uh, and I am a part of the Vermont Institute of Community and International Involvement. And I'm here tonight to talk to you a little bit about what I think is, are the most important issues facing us in the United States today, and that is the violations of our Constitution and our Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights distinguishes, I believe, the United States from all other countries on the globe. They are outlined rights from the government, and we must understand that. There are very few people, very few countries in the world that, uh, that operate with liberty from the government. And those restrictions that most governments place on people's rights are to do with free speech, are to do with the right to assemble, the right to petition our government, the right to worship as we please or not, as we also may please not to do. All those rights are freedom from government interference in those basic rights. And today, I believe that this is the most important rights that have been challenged by the United States. And this, to me, are the important election uh, issues also. To me, it's not a difference between the Republicans or the Democrats. To me, it, the difference that we face is between our right to remain a free people under our Bill of Rights and our rights to be government controlled in those rights. So tonight we have a very important case that has been filed on behalf of um, a group of students at UVM. Those students were called Students for Justice in Palestine. And they were rather summarily suspended from being on campus, and I guess they have not been reinstated. And it's very unclear to me why they were suspended, why they have not been reinstated. Um, and it has at least something to do with their rights to speak. And those rights have been denied by the University of Vermont. We have with us tonight to discuss that issue uh, and a, a free speech expert, two of them, as a matter of fact. Uh, one of them, an old colleague of mine. I mean that in terms of the years we've well, been both, colleagues. Both are true. Both are true. Right, and also true. And that is John Franco Esquire who uh, is with us tonight because he files suit against UVM. And I want him here tonight to explain to you why that suit is happening um, and what, uh, what the rights of those students, how they have been impinged upon, and whether or not we are going to be successful in forcing the university in a way to give the students the right to be on campus again. Those students were, as I said, students for justice in Palestine. I might remind us all, if we watch Amy Goodman on a regular basis, that these student protesters protesting basically to end the very serious war that's occurring right now between Israel and uh, in Gaza and now in Lebanon, that those students who are protesting that war are being shut down all over the United States, not just at UVM, but all over. To me, it is a serious change in university behavior. I was part, as many of us were here, uh, part of the anti-Vietnam War protests that occurred in my university many years ago at the University of Wisconsin. We were all treated badly, but in the end, we were all allowed to protest. Those rights are being seriously challenged all over the United States. This, to me, though, is the first lawsuit, the federal lawsuit, that has been filed on behalf of those students, particularly those students for justice in Palestine. I think that they're a national group, aren't they? Have you discussed that? It's, it's the second suit that's been filed. The second suit, the University of Maryland, right? No, Florida. No? Florida. Florida. I'll, I'll get into that. Okay. Anyway, so here's John Franco. I might mention that John Franco was the first city attorney for Bernie Sanders many, many years ago when he became mayor. The second speaker will be Jared Carter, who is also a lawyer, and he's a professor here at Vermont Law School, and he is a constitutional scholar, right, Jared, I guess? Of sorts. And he's an old colleague, younger colleague, but many years colleague of mine also. So here's John. Okay, let me start out by, I've got a lot to cover, um, to try to give you what the general background of the suspension was. Um, in the spring, um, Elise Stefanik and the Republicans in Congress summoned a number of um, presidents of universities before them um, to dress them down and to bully them because they were not cracking down sufficiently on the uh, pro-Palestinian protesters. And in particular, the um, president of, now the former president of Columbia, 
By the way, all the all the ones who were fired it were women. If you haven't noticed that, the four ones that got, they were all women. Um, went back and cracked down on the encampment at Columbia. That sparked a nationwide uh, reaction on college campuses that started around the last weekend of April. Uh, and that was also the case here at UVM. Uh, UVM students for justice in pa Palestine were, in, uh, were one of a number of student groups and individuals who put together a protest at uh, UVM in the so-called uh, Harris Commons, you know, Andrew Harris Commons, which is the big area between the library, the Moore Hall, the New Davis Center, the Life Science Building. It's it, the old days. The center of the campus used to be the green, but now that's really more the center of activity. Um, and so one of the one of the sins they they committed was erecting some tents as part of an encampment, as part of the protest. And they did this, heaven forbid. On a rainy Sunday afternoon on the 28th of April, when three of our mosque areas were still open, because it's still, you know, a good part of the state still winter. Um, three days later, the university issued Students for Justice in Palestine an order suspending them as, as, a, uni as a university student group for kind of general, um, you are bad people who are a threat to, uh, to a threat to our students, our staff, and our visitors, um, and you're therefore suspended. We have reason to believe that you're bad people, and you're suspended pending our investigation into whether or not you're bad people. Um, and that occurred on May 1st. May 1st was also a very interesting day. That was the day when Governor Sununu sent armed goons to Dartmouth to brutally suppress the peaceful demonstration that occurred on the, on the uh, Dartmouth Green that day, which included seriously injuring a, uh, a, a, a history and a, a late 60-year-old history and labor uh, professor there who actually lives in Vermont. Um, and those, those kinds of crackdowns also occurred about the same day. Um, the protest at UVM went on for about 10 days. Um, it ended around the 7th or 8th of May. They voluntarily disbanded the encampment. Um, it was by all accounts peaceful. Um, they, had, they, had been, they had trained their participants in nonviolence. Um, they had tr people trained in de-escalation because there were um, pro-Israeli demonstrators that showed up um, and uh, demonstrated, counter-demonstrated at the same site. There was no, there was no violence there at all. Um, unlike, by the way, UCLA. Let's talk about UCLA for a minute. What they did at UCLA is the pro-Israeli uh, demonstrators physically attacked the Palestinian demonstrators with sticks and bats and I don't know if there weren't any guns, but spheres chemicals. And, and chemicals. And as a result, the most recently, the university, uh, the UCLA, got um, sued by pro-Israeli pro, pro groups under Title VI for not being sufficiently aggressive against the Palestinian student protesters. Not a whiff of the fact that this attack on the Palestinian pro-Palestinian uh, pro uh, students was uh, went on for three hours with the police literally looking the other way, which is exactly what happened in Germany and under Kristallnacht in the 1930s. I mean, it's it's a pride and truth what happened in the South when you had the can the Klan beat up and, and lynch African Americans. Um, so, um, what? You know, if I was to say that this ban had much of a practical effect during the balance of the protests, it probably wouldn't be true. I don't think the the members of SJP did a whole lot to, to censor themselves. And then, you know, they, they disbanded around May 8th. It was when classes ended and exams started and UVM graduated the week after that. And then you had the summer session. And during that period of time, right in May, um, this suspension notice was brought to my attention through um, their, um, the student's faculty advisor, Helen Scott, who had been in contact with uh, Barbie Prine and some other attorneys in, uh, in Burlington and said, you need to look at this. I saw the suspension notice that they got, and I was appalled. I mean, I was appalled. I don't know if any of you remember the Pentagon Papers case in 1971, where the U.S. Supreme Court struck down the, the Nixon administration's efforts to uh, to uh, censor the publication of the Pentagon Papers by the New York Times and the Washington Post. And the U U.S. Supreme Court said, you can't do that. It's a prior, prior restraint of protected First Amendment speech. That is exactly what UVM did. 
You've got to be kidding me. This is one of the most famous civil liberties cases in the history of the United States. United, uh, New York Times versus the United States. I mean, and they were, they were prosecuted under the Espionage Act. And that what UVM has done here is a prior restraint of this group's entire spectrum of First Amendment rights on campus. The only thing they can meet about is to address the investigation that the university is supposedly doing. Now, I want to get the investigation part for a bit. They said in their order that the suspension was in effect while they had these allegations or these suspensions under investigation. Their procedures, the student disciplinary procedures say, and they, they, I mean, and let me stop there for a minute. That's out of Alice in Wonderland. First you get the sentence and then you get the evidence afterward. You, that's, not, that's not what we have in the United States. And so they're saying you're suspended until we investigate whether it's true. Well, it can't work, that, it can't possibly work that way. Um, the other thing that happened is they said, well, you know, we will do, we will do the investigation promptly. Well, you know, people were on vacation. It was June and July, and August came around, and I said to Helen Scott, I said, well, what's the status with the suspension? I mean, class is going to resume in, in August. So we wrote, we, we contacted uh, the, uh, we contacted the, uh, uh, the, the woman who's one of the defendants, uh, Linda uh, Balcom, who's the director of Student Life, who actually was the one under the rules who made the decision to do the suspension. And we said, you know, we wanted to meet with them informally to talk with them about how messed up the suspension order was constitutionally. We asked, this is a little biblical, we asked and were denied three times. Um, we asked, and finally we sent a letter, and we said, you know, we, we want to, we want, we, and they said, well, you've got to go through the student process. Oh, this is the student process they have. At least in Russia, they put you in a cage and give you a lawyer. They give you a lawyer, but they put you in a cage. Here what they do if you're a student. You either have to go in through their administrative process and admit your guilt, get on bended knee, and then ask for their clemency for what you did, or you have to go through the investigation process, but there's a catch. If you're an undergraduate student facing the entire administrative apparatus of the University of Vermont, including all their lawyers, you cannot be present with a student advisor, with a faculty advisor, and you cannot have an attorney. You cannot have an attorney. That, that really, that's really, that's a fair process. So I said to Helen, I said, if you think I'm going to send my clients in front of them without counsel, you ought to cure cotton pick in mind. And so we wrote to the university's counsel. We said, we're not going to go to there that without counsel. You're out of your cotton pick in mind. You're not going to do it. Well, those are the procedures and those what you have to follow. Um, and so then we began to work in earnest uh, putting together the, um, the lawsuit. Um, and uh, part of what we did is not only pointing out the, the complete unconstitutionality of this prior suspension of this group, but the flaws, the university's reasoning is, they said this in the press release, we believe in free speech as long as you follow our rules and procedures. That is classic. Classic, less classic, less. You know how they, why they got their heads beat in at the, at the Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama in 1965? for marching without a permit. You know why they got fire hosed in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963 by Bull Connor for protesting without a permit? In fact, the language of the, of the notice of violation that they used against uh, UVM SJP was almost verbatim out of the ordinance that Birmingham, Alabama had in 1963 that they used for prosecuting the, uh, uh, those, those protesters and sentencing them to hard labor, I might add. Um, I, mean, I mean, I don't know that they did it consciously, but this is the lineage of this is the lineage that the repression comes from. There are a ton of civil liberties cases, not the least of which was called Shuttlesworth versus City of Alabama. It was the second time that 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 uh, that uh, that protest case went to the U.S. Supreme Court. That was decided in 1969, and they said. If you have time, place, and manner restrictions like this, you cannot have these blanket exceptions that say, but we can prohibit the demonstration if we determine that it's going to be uh, dangerous to public morals or public order or be, you know, what did they, do? well, I'll give you some of the things that they said here. Um, just a second, I got to find it. Um, this is just too good. Oh, here we go. This is this is good. The University of Vermont is suspending all operations of SJP on an interim basis, effective immediately. 
We are taking this action because of the continuation of concerning behavior. Mind you, concerning behavior, everybody. Look out for concerning behavior. Sandy, your concerning behavior. Your behavior has always been concerning. I used to get beat up in her house for that, but anyway, we won't get into that. Um, Please. <laughs> and encouraging, mind you, this is Latin, horribly dicto, horrible to say, willful violation of university policies for repeated notice and requests to cease. These actions have had a direct impact on the safety of students in university operations. Interim suspension is appropriate in circumstances where, in, as in this case, preliminary evidence demonstrates that an organization's activity may pose a threat to the health, safety, and well-being of persons within the university community and our guests. There you have it, read right? Bull Connor, Commissioner of Public Safety, Birmingham, Alabama, 1963. Thank you, Bull. That's where that kind of thinking came from. It's as old as time. The Shuttlesworth case talked about how that's old, as old as time. You can't do that. And when you have that, you have a sham. And what, the, what they well, then what we did is we said, aha, okay. So they they suspended uh, SAP. Has there ever been another case where they have? suspended anybody for protected activity as far as we can tell the answer to that is no never has happened and i i went to uvm and we did we did some stuff and it was a lot more disruptive than this and let me give you um some let me let me read some what we did some of the research i did and found out and by the way the newspaper of record about what goes on at uvm for protests is a student newspaper the vermont cynic absolutely have the best coverage of what was going on mm -hmm. oh yeah they really did a good job in fact the nice thing about it i'll give you a little issue about the uh, rules of evidence. The Vermont Cynic is a publication of the University of Vermont, and it's published on the internet. Therefore, it's a government publication. It means I can just use anything they say in a court of law because it's the equivalent of a government publication. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> um, let me see here. Hang on, I got to find it. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, this is the good stuff. Um, Previous protests, September 17, 2017, 200 students marched into the Waterman building to the UVM president's office with a list of demands regarding racial disparity in the university. Uh, participating organizations for the Black Student Union, uh, uh, I don't know if I pronounce this correctly, uh, Alianza Latinx in the Asian Student Union. Mm -hmm. Do we know, to our knowledge, no disciplinary action. February 20, 20th to 23rd, 2018. A group of students called No Names for Justice held various demonstrations regarding racial injustice on campus. They took over classrooms. They blocked traffic on Main Street by the Davis Center at rush hour, which, by the way, is an access to a tertiary care medical facility. They marched to the Waterman Building along with Black Lives Matter and occupied the atrium area inside the building for 10 hours. As far as we know, no student, no student, no student uh, disciplinary action, no suspension. This is a good one. February 26, uh, 2019, No Names for Justice held another rally, this is a year later, inside the atrium of the UVM Waterman building uh, to mark the one-year anniversary of the so-called Waterman occupation for the year before. Mm -hmm. And I'll get to you in a minute why that happened. September 20th, 2019, hundreds of students walk out of classes at 11 a.m. Uh, to strike and attend a strike alert rally at the Andrew Harris Commons, same comments. To protest in action on climate change, participating groups included VPIRG, Sunri the Sunrise Movement, Climate Communications Advocacy, and the Literary uh, Laboratory, Liter Literacy Laboratory, excuse me. Three days later, September 23rd, 2019, same group of students which called themselves the, Ex the uh, Extinction Rebellion MV uh, BVT blocked traffic on Main Street again by Davis Center during rush hour to protest in action on climate change. Again, blocking ve vehicular access to a tertiary care medical facility. No action taken. February 18th, 2021, a group of hashtag MeToo students staged a protest of UVM's admitted students visiting day to protest UVM's response to allegations of sexual assault on campus, particularly on the part of members of its, of its athletic teams. This complaint sexual assault, by the way, now is in federal court in a case called Ware versus UVM, which is being heard by the same judge that has our case here, uh, by the way. Uh, two to three hundred students congregated at the Harris, uh, Andrew Harris Commons and proceeded through the Davis Center marching and chanting and obviously disrupting things, right? No action was taken. May 3rd, 2021, thousands of students gathered at the Redstone Green to again protest UVM's alleged complicity in sexual assault. They blocked traffic while they marched to the UVM Green and then the Waterman Building. 
they held a protest rally on the steps of the building, which spilled over onto the adjoining South Prospect Street, Street and the UVM Green, again blocking, blocking traffic. No action taken. And finally, my favorite, an oldie but goodie, pre-marijuana legalization in Vermont, the 420 protests, April 20th protests, uh, on the, uh, uh, I believe it was the uh, Simpson Green down on the South Campus for smoke in and practice every um, every day annually on 420, which is also Hitler's birthday. Um, so the only one of these involved in that I could tell from my research that involved a, uh, any kind of sanction was the ones that had the, the anniversary protest in the atrium of the Waterman Building. And there were individual student uh, disciplinary actions that were brought at that time. And the claim was that they were in the atrium with bullhorns having this rally. And if you're in the atrium, it's inside a building, it's very noisy. And they said there were, that was not an appropriate venue and there were better, uh, there were better venues um, to hold that elsewhere on the campus. Now, the, here's, here's the reason, and I'll get to what their, one, of their, one, of their, one of their protest conditions is. One of their protest conditions is, if you're a student and you want to get a permit for a protest, you have to sign away your personal liability for the damages for anything that happens. Well, the Black Student Union was going to hold this commemoration in the Memorial Auditorium of Waterman. And they required the black st student unions to sign on the dotted lines that said that they would be responsible for any ensuing damages. The black student union told them where to shove it, and they went and had the thing out without a permit on the atrium. So that shows you the logic of the, uh, the various uh, permitting uh, uh, procedures that they have. Now, of all the things that were done at the university during this protest, the only one that was not presumptively protected constitutionally was sleeping in the tents. Okay, the U.S. Supreme Court, in its infinite wisdom, in a case in 1994, 1994 called Clark versus uh, uh, Citizens for Creative Nonviolence, uh, it involved a encampment protest in Lafayette Park, which is across from the White House, and it was this, the National Park Service brought an enforcement action, and the upshot of it is the Supreme Court said putting up tents is a very powerful form of symbolic speech. But sleeping in tents isn't. So the bottom line of what the university should have done, rather than weaponizing the permit requirements at, um, at this protest, have simply said, look, everything you're doing here is presumptively protected under the Constitution. We're giving you a permit. We're giving you a permit. Here, back, back, back of their no trespassing. Permit granted. The only thing you can't do is you can't sleep in the tents overnight. If you do that, you do it at your own risk. And then the students would have an informed, make an informed decision about what their, what their risks were. They didn't do that. They didn't do that. They went around and weaponized. Well, you're violating our procedures. You don't have permits. You don't have this. You don't have that. And you know, the, the, you know, unless you toe the line, the wrath of God is going to come down on you. And that's what they did. And then they went after these students individually. The interesting thing about the individual students is every single one of those cases that was, that was contested, there were some students who said, look, I'm going to graduate. I don't want to hold up my degree. I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to go through the administrative process. I get a slap on the wrist and went. The ones who contested it, there was not a single student who contested who was found responsible or found had violated the student policy. And part of the findings that they had, they, were, they said, number one, protesting doesn't violate the facilities use policy, which is one of the things that they were claimed to have violated. Um, the facility use po policy doesn't apply to the green of, of the Harris, uh, Andrew Harris comments. It only applies to internal facilities, buildings, and things like that. Um, and they also said in terms of the big thing was, well, we told you to not, not, we told you to remove the tents and you didn't remove the tents. And they said, well, those are other people's tents and you don't have any power over the other people. You know, you had, that university had to find out whose tents they were and give them an order and they didn't do that. Um, so that, that individual effort all collapsed. But one of the things we also have attacked here in this lawsuit is how, um, and really draw, drawing a line right directly to uh, the types of repressions that have occurred uh, throughout the country involving, uh, involving uh, protests, is um, that their policies at critical junctures give unbridled discretion to people like Michael Schirling at University Security, mm -hmm. uh, particularly for their tenting policy. Mm -hmm. Their facilities use policy says, Protests. They they told the students that the pro they had to get permits under their facility use policies. That's not what the facility use policy says. The facility use policy says protests are under the jurisdiction of the dean of students. 
You know what the standards are for the dean of students, to whether to grant a, pro a permit for protesting? There aren't any, none. Bull Connor, once again, none. Then, th then you have then you have the contradiction between that and their 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 uh, their display policy dis display in in uh, uh, well, it's actually it's their their temporary structures policy. The temporary structures policy said temporary structures can be allowed unless. Michael Schrillings thinks that they're a danger, and then if they go into the bureaucracy about being permitted for a facility, then there's another, there's another catch-all that says it still may be denied if we think it's bad or think it's going to be a problem. In all the cases that have dealt with these that have been held, that have been 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 decided by the federal court, say that kind of blanket discretion is just not permitted because it gives you the ability to pick and choose who can get who can protest and who can't based upon the content of the message. And so then, and then the, this is what's really good. When we, and for those of you who don't know the law, I will give you this little uh, diversion. We live in what's called the Second Circuit. Federal appeals courts are divided into circuits. Um, and uh, we are the federal, the federal appeals court, we're in the Second Circuit. The Second Circuit is Vermont, Connecticut, New York. And uh, there's a wonderful decision out of the Second Circuit called uh, McDonald versus Shafir, Shafir, who was the head of the Parks Department in New York City, that said that when you have a wide open ability of, this, of the municipality or whoever is granting the permit to deny, uh, to deny a permit because bad things might happen, that's unconstitutional unless you can point to a past administrative practice and definitive administrative policies which lay out, in fact, in practice, when these permits will grant, be granted and when they will be denied. And that's where all these prior protests, which have occurred at UVM where they didn't do a cotton picking thing, come into play. They can't show by past practice that this was anything other than a content-based discrimination uh, that, that protesting in favor of Palestinians and against Gaza is taboo. Climate change isn't taboo. Racial equity isn't taboo. Me too isn't taboo. This is taboo. This is taboo. That is basically uh, what what we think this shows. Um, there, there. Uh, let me go through some of the things we're attacking here. There. Um, first of all, we said in two counts, we don't care what they did. Maybe short of firebombing the university, cannot suspend somebody's. On a on a on a on a, on a, a, a prior restraint basis, a group's constitutional rights. You just can't do that. And some of the cases we had were really good ones. There was one um, two years one year after the Pentagon's Papers case was called um, was it Healy versus James, and that involved a case where I forgot the name of the cause. They tried to prevent Students for Democratic Society being recognized as a student organization because they were bad, because they were extreme leftists, blah, 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 blah. The Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. That involves a suspending a student organization, denies them access to all the university facilities and their ability to, uh, to meet, to associate, to protest, to demonstrate. Then there was another one that was a little bit later, two years later. It's a, a, probably one of the first gay student demonstrations in, in uh, the United States, 1974. It was a gay student union of, um, of uh, the University of, uh, of New Hampshire that was not recognized as a, as a student group. And the Court of Appeals, not Court of Appeals, U.S. District Court in New Hampshire said, you've got to recognize them. You can't withhold, you can't withhold student recognition, recognition for, for a, a gay student group. I mean, this is protected First Amendment activity. Mm -hmm. And some of, the, the, some of the other ones that have happened after that, there was, a, there was another case involving an anti-Islam anti, uh, protest by the uh, Young College Republicans in some college in, I think it was San Francisco. Um, and the college tried to suspend their status as a student organization. And again, the, the district court, the federal district court in, in California said, you can't do that. Even if some people consider the speech to be horrific, you can't do that. It's just not permitted. Um, and so that just really undermines the, um, the argument that, well, I don't know what UVM could argue that SJP was doing that would justify the breadth of this prior restraint. I mean, think about what this means. They can't talk about the presidential election. They can't talk about state elections. They can't talk about legislative elections. They can't talk about city policy. They can't talk about homelessness in Burlington. They can't talk about the mayor. They can't talk about anything except the investigation they're under. That's the breadth. That's the breadth of this order. Are you kidding me? 
I mean, you think this is a Latin American military junta that just outlawed, you know, political parties, which is really this is also the lineage of this, of this kind of uh, this kind of an order. Um, the, the 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 protests and demonstrations. I kind of touched on that. They're, what they were handing out to the students that say that they said uh, the uh, um, it violated the facilities used for events and activities and they had to go get permits that was wrong because it specifically provides that demonstrations are subject to the jurisdiction of the dean um, and uh, there's no standards for that um, and um, some other problems um, Oh, the prior registration things, you have to prior register, you have to sign on the dotted line that you're going to be liable. Those things have all been thrown out um, in the past. Um, oh, the tents. Lots of case law in the federal courts after the Occupy movement have, that have said, sorry, folks, tents are protected symbolic speech. You have to accommodate them. They got all in a pinch because of the tents. They were just dead wrong about that. I mean, there's some of the most wonderful cases out of states you'd never believe it. U.S. District Court in Idaho, it's Waters case, and they were they were protesting on, I forgot where it was, but they were, um, they said what what the Idaho what, what the Idaho court said at the at the end. Look at everything they're doing is protected, with the exception of sleeping in the tents overnight. That's not protected constitutionally. However, they said you can have enough people there overnight. To watch things, make sure that they're not destroyed or stolen. Uh, so uh, the the other fun case was called Occupy Columbia versus Haley. Now it was not Columbia University; it's Columbia, South Carolina. And Haley was Nikki Haley, and it involved the uh, an Occupy uh, activities and encampment on the state house grounds in uh, in South Carolina. And that federal court just gave them a run for their money on that. I mean, they just said, you know, what are you doing? They were they were they were, they were busy. It's a great, and it's great and it's great wisdom. The South Carolina legislature banned tenting tenting expressions that specifically dealt with this form of protest. I mean, it was content based. It was just wonderful. Um, and another really good one involved um, the city of New Haven, Connecticut, that involved an Occupy movement in the New Haven Green. I mean, that has some that has some really good precedents that we can use. Not the least of which they said you have to look at whether or not. There was an administrative precedent which show which show that um, the city of New Haven was uh, exercising some very strict and, and specific uh, guidelines as to whether or not the uh, the activity would be granted or not. And they they said they said in that case that they had those guidelines and those guidelines had been followed. Um, they also and that's going to really hurt UVM because it says you look for their past administrative practice, which the UVM can't can't show. And, and the other beautiful thing in that case is they pointed out, they said, look, just because you, just because you don't allow the tents here, well, you've got to provide alternative time, place, or effective time, place, or manner alternatives. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to give them a tenting place over there. And what they did at the end of the decision, even though the poor, the poor city of, of, of New Haven, they march down, think they're at the goal line, they're going to win. And the judge says, now I expect you to go meet and confer. And I'm sure when you meet and confer, you will work out places where these, this protest will be, will be allowed to the satisfaction of both parties. Now get the hell out of here. <laughs> Um, and that's what we tried to do with UVM in, in July and August. I had read these cases, these meetings. I wanted to meet and confer with them and said, you know, what are you doing? You can't do this. So one of the things we've, we're arguing here is about the tents. Look, folks, if you don't like the tents on this little part of the uh, Andrew Harris Commons, you've got to move them over to another part of the camp. Or you can move them down to UVM Green. You know, you don't like them, you can move them down to the UVM Green. You've got to, you've got to allow, um, uh, 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 you've got to allow an alternative uh, means of, uh, an effective means of engaging in that, um, that collective action, that uh, concerted action, uh, that right to assemble, and the right to speak uh, 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 symbolically. Um, you can't just be like Michael Sherling and say no. Um, Go ahead. Okay, well, Jared, were you? Yeah, I mean, I don't have a specific presentation prepared per se, obviously it's, it's Attorney Franco's case, but I, I guess I, I would love to sort of suss out some of the things that you pointed suss out. Suss out? Yeah, suss out. Um, you ever heard that word? Yeah, and then I'll get, no. into my, I'll get into my ex party young put it, in, put it in a brief, it's a good word. Um, so I guess one of the things that, I, that, I, I, that I come to mind is, um, so certainly under the First Amendment and, and, and a lot of the cases that you cite, cited here and, and I think in the, in the materials as well, uh, university can't 
engage in content discrimination, in other words, picking winners and losers in terms right. of messages. Right. But can't universities pass and, and enforce regulations that prohibit disruption of campus events? And, and did they make that assertion here? And how does that sort of fit together? They made that assertion, but the problem, the other classic case, 1969, the Vietnam War black arm, base, mm -hmm. black arm band case, Tinker versus Des Moines, mm -hmm. said, well, you can you can uh, keep in mind this was a this is not a college this was a high school secondary school. school, right. school. Mm -hmm. you, you know you have a right to maintain order, but you've really got to show you've got a really high burden to show that it was actually disruptive. Mm -hmm. And what they've done in the university cases, they said, the uh, Healy case said, "Hello." After Kent State, we just lowered the age of majority. Remember that? And the voting age is down, and you can contract now. These were adults in local parentheses. Going to local parentheses used to be colleges acted in the place of parents. That's gone. UVM doesn't think that that's gone, but that's gone. Mm. And so now, and what you have now is not only you have adults that are going to your college, you have adults that are paying over $100,000 to go to your college. They're your customers. This is how you're treating your customers. I mean, whew. So, but your question was, what was no? I, I think I think he, he got at it. I guess I I I'm trying. What's where do they, where does where do you draw that line from sort of first member perspective as as to what when does something become disruptive and therefore can be can be regulated prohibited versus expressive conduct um, because it seems like that's really the the rub here, right? The first amendment protects speech. Right? Yeah. It doesn't say anything about conduct in the first amendment. No, it's the conduct. courts have of course interpreted that to include expressive conduct. So, so conduct that speaks is protected under the First Amendment. But how do you sort of see no, that? Symbolic, symbolic speech is all the tense are symbolic. Mm -hmm. Tense are a form of speech. And the answer, uh, uh, and Mr. Okay. Answer Man is going to come with the answer. <laughs> the answer is that, um, hang on a sec. The, that the, the, uh, that the university has a very high burden, a very extremely high burden to prove that this was actually disruptive. That people don't like the content of your message is not disruptive. Right. That you've got tents out there where there normally aren't tents out there, that's not disruptive. That's just not gonna, that's not gonna, not gonna meet the standard. Um, I mean, again, what happened in the Pentagon Papers case, they were in violation of the Espionage Act. But, I mean, mm -hmm. Ellsberg figured he was gonna go to prison for a very long time. He would have if they hadn't broken into a psychiatrist's office, but that's another story. Um, here, so here, 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 to justify a suspension, the acts complained of must materially and substantially disrupt the work and discipline of the school. Materially and substantially. The record must show a substantial basis for the conclusion and not be based upon surmise and speculation. Um, and the and so that's, you know, you really got to show a lot. I mean, if they were running, for example, they were running through classes and they were really disrupting classes, which happened with some of these other protests, then I think they would have, they would have something to argue about. And there's another thing that's, that's referred to as a heckler's veto. If somebody else is speaking and you, you go and you disrupt the speech, that's not protected activity. Actually, in Vermont law, that's a form of disorderly conduct. That's a criminal violation. That case is called State versus Stacey. Um, uh, we want, do you have other questions or maybe we could open it up to the audience as well but I have so there's no basis therefore none whatsoever to suspend students for justice in Palestine what they do nothing did they do anything to disrupt well what they even even if they told students screw it sleep in the tents overnight that's not a grounds to suspend their First Amendment rights it just isn't but this is also an organization mm -hmm. Well, well that's the other problem is the organization didn't sleep overnight. The organization didn't own any tents. So how and that's, that's why the individuals who they brought in on these charges were, were acquitted because they couldn't show. But the, uh, Logan Pruitt, who was the, the spokesperson for SJP, one of the charges they had was, oh, he was sleeping overnight because he was sitting in an Adirondack chair in a sleeping bag in the morning. And he said, yeah, it was cold. <laughs> Yeah, but but they, but you said that they suspended the Ordinance. organization. How on earth do they justify that? It has not been reinstated, correct? I read you the justification they made that we have information and belief that you're bad people. Bad people? No, they look at it's bad. Look at the etymology of this is Robespierre and the Committee of Public Safety in the French Revolution. Right. You know what is what was Berea the head of in the Soviet Union? 
The organization of state security is always framed in terms of safety. Safety to our students, safety to our staff, yeah, but, safety to this, safety to that. But there was, as far as I can tell from everything you said, there wasn't one action that this society or student organization took to indicate that it was unsafe, or there's no actions that they took. Did they take any this, actions? This, compared to the other protests that occurred, this was a very, Nothing. the way, what do you, this was a very, 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 very peaceful, non-disruptive event. I mean, unbelievable. Unbelievable that they picked out this one, compared to all the other ones that have occurred, including 420, I mean, my God. The whole the whole green was levitating from the marijuana smoke, which was illegal at the time. Which, Kind of prohibits action a lot. Anyway, right? Okay, Musa. Who's the oh, um, is anybody checking on who's behind all of these? You know, working with universities. You know, my what we know is Jonathan Greenblatt. You know, I'll mention him by name of the ADL has it's been. ADL club though, from people who don't know, what's ADL? Um, uh, right, Anti-Defamation League. Right. And they have been very active in clobbering universities in doing the wrong thing. And uh, is that, you know, being discussed or checked or, you know, what they're, uh, how they are connected well, with the university here and others? Well, if you guys want to fundraise a million bucks so we could do the discovery on this, yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's something we might be able to find out. I mean, I think you can kind of, uh, I think inferentially it's very clear. What we mentioned in, what we mentioned in the complaint was, the cancellation of the Palestinian poet, and it turned out, based upon a public records request by seven days, they had nothing. It was just Michael Sherling that just decided to shut him down. And I think it was basically Mike. This has this suspension has Michael Sherling's fingerprints all over it. It's a it's a it's a, it's a cop's idea of civil liberties. That's what it is. For, John, so thank you for what you're doing. Michael this Sherling is. is? Former chief of police, former right. head of the Vermont Department of Public Safety, now head of. But I, I to, to answer that, I suspect. One of the things that's going on here is they had this titles, Title VI complaint that was brought against UVM for not cracking down on anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And I have a suspicion that right. one of the things that UVM may be up to here is they did this, to, they're, they're doing this to try to inoculate themselves against a, a Title VI lawsuit. There have been a number, there have been three major Title VI lawsuits filed in the last couple of months against um, uh, UCLA, I mentioned that, against um, uh, MIT and against Harvard. And, but here's an important distinction, except for UCLA, and, and I should probably should have said this at the outset. There's a big difference between Columbia and MIT and, and Harvard and UVM. UVM is a state university. Yes. When you're a state university, all the constitutional protections apply to them. Mm -hmm. They can't, all the civil liberties. If you're, if you're a private university, it's university policy. It's, that's what, if they want to have a crackdown, there's no protest, or we're not going to allow certain things to be said. I don't know what the I don't know what other restrictions they might have if they're getting governmental funding or things like yeah. that. But in terms of are they subject to the, the Constitution. constitutional restrictions? The answer to that is no. UVM is UVM's a state college. That's a big difference. And I think the idiots at UVM kind of forgot that. I think they saw Dartmouth doing this and Columbia doing this and MIT doing this and Harvard doing this, and they forgot. Hey, we're state university. First Amendment applies. Thank you for what you are doing. It's <laughs> thank you for what you're doing. Wafik? Yes, thank you again. Uh, I think the elephant in the room on the, uh, on the UVM institution and across the countries on the universities, including the Department of Education, is not the action of the students because other organizations did the same actions and they didn't get the same response. It is the changing of definition of anti-Semitism. And this is the elephant on the room. And they are trying on the uh, Department of Education in Vermont and Anti-Deformation League and other organization, they wrote a letter for the Department of Education that any criticism of State of Israel, any mentioning negatively to Zionism, it is considered anti-Semitism and anti-Jewish. And this is the uh, major uh, principle. Uh, the other thing for freedom of speech across the country, we have 32 states uh, through executive orders or state uh, 
uh, uh, state representative voted to make our action of uh, divestment sanctions as illegal. And this is too against the freedom of speech. I can boycott Starbucks because they didn't welcome uh, three black customers and they kicked them out, but I cannot boycott Starbucks for, because they are supporting the Israeli. The boycotting is protected First Amendment activity. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just. Anyone else? Steve. Did the students make any demands at all, or was it just they were just uh, their presence? Demands. They had some demands, and they had demands about uh, divestment and disclosure, and then there was a demand about the uh, the commencement speaker, who was the uh, UV, the UVM, the UN oh, yeah. the UVM secretary, who um, decided not to come, um, and that was and that was and then after that happened, it, plus classes were ending and people were leaving, and that kind of the the wind was out of their sails, so they decided to. Uh, they decided to, to voluntarily end it. Um, I wonder, what I wanted to read, oh, the, oh, you want to talk about the double standard. This is, this is the case. Um, call, cause Republicans at San Francisco State University versus Reed, it was decided in 2007. The holding was college Republicans could not be suspended as a student organization for at a rally desecrating Hamas and Hezbollah flags with the word Allah written on them in Arabic script. It reasoned that unpopular spe speech was not only protected, but its protection was essential to the First Amendment. The university's laudable interest in promoting civil discourse on campus from time to time comes in direct conflict with the First Amendment rights, which entitle people in some settings to express themselves in unreason, disrespectful, and intensely emotional ways. Thus, a student might simultaneously be behave in a manner that is patently inconsistent with the civility goals, but that is protected under the First Amendment. There, and then it goes on to say, there are very important differences between primary and secondary schools on one hand and colleges and universities on the other. Colleges and university students are not children, are by law emancip emancipated and can vote. First Amendment to protection should not apply with less force on college campuses than in the community at large. Federal courts have enjoined regulations in college uh, 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 college universities, colleges or universities which pur purport to prohibit acts of intolerance. And then it goes on to talk about um, how they have a higher duty than to the First Amendment to protect unpopular notions. And then I cite, my favorite, Vermont Supreme Court in a number of cases in called State versus Tracy 2015, um, which said that this is a very important case. They said the same thing about offensive speech. They said, this is citing the flag desecration and the, mm -hmm. fu the fundamentalist church picketing a soldier's funeral with highly inflammatory right. signs. Right. It held that it is, the, it is the provocative nature of speech, which is the very reason it is constitutionally protective. Offensiveness is not enough to fall outside of free speech. It must be so inflammatory so that it is akin to dropping a match into a pool of gasoline. That's the standard under the Vermont Supreme Court to have so-called fighting word speech not be protected by the First Amendment. So this is all, you're exactly right, this is all what it's up to. They, were, they did this, they tried this in that the Brandeis complaint against UVM, which was never even investigated. They never even talked to anybody. Um, that was just complete, it was complete BS. Job, but that's what they're trying to do. Yeah, and the, the argument is that yeah, that that if you are if you are if you're critical of Israel, crit critical of Zionism, you violated Title VI, and the universities need to shut that up. And that's right out of Louis uh, Elise Stefanik's playbook. That's what she's saying. That's exactly what she's saying. It's not a distinction. Of course, if anybody with a half a notion of the history of the evolution of Zionism, particularly in the 19th century, knows, and nothing's further from the truth than that. When uh, when will the university be re have to respond to this? Oh crap! God only knows that. I thought they, don't in they theory, have... in theory, they're supposed to be responding to. I thought we'd have a hearing by now. Yeah. Because it's a request for preliminary injunctive relief. Um, ordinarily, the response to the memorandum, the motion for the injunction, would be 14 days, which will be Wednesday or th Thursday. Mm -hmm. um, and then their time to file a formal answer would be uh, about a week after that. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm, I'm, and I don't know what Judge Sessions is doing. He may be waiting to see the university's response before he does anything, um, before he holds a hearing um, or what have you. But she didn't explain what a, the preliminary injunction 
Preliminary injunction means uh, what we're asking for, uh, ending the defendant's May 1st, 2024 interim suspension of its status as a UVM organization pending, pending the resolution of this litigation. Mm -hmm. While the court case is on, they're reinstated. That's what we're but I, I still don't understand. How do you suspend an organization? You don't let them function on campus. No, they can't meet. That, but you know what, what they did in the Healy reason? case? They arrested them for having SDS for having a meeting in a coffee shop We're, on campus. They arrested the members. They don't, right? right. Well, I guess that this. So that's what I'm saying, and I, and and I'd be curious. What did specifically? I mean, I know you yeah. read us the language, but were there specific things that the university alleged that the group did? Good. That violated, or do they? They just said it's it, all under it, investigation. Right. It's preliminary. We've heard. But it wasn't that they slept overnight in the tents. They didn't allege that. They didn't. They just said you violated this policy that we have, and so it's you're, content based, you're, obviously. Yeah. Correct. It's totally. Yeah. It's total bullshit. What? Yeah. I mean, uh, are there students that are suspended also now, or is it just the organization? There have been no students. The students that have been suspended. So the any student that was camped out there last year, if they were still in school, they're back. They're not. They're they never. They tried to bring individual charges against them. They couldn't prove it because they didn't have anybody to say this. We saw this person go into ten at ten and come out. Who was gonna? What are you gonna? You gonna give a whole? You know, <laughs> sit Shiva out in front of the tent to see if somebody is sleeping there. I mean, that's how their. That's how their. That's how their. Their case fell apart. So, the, so this is strictly about oh, wait, an organization. A, it doesn't involve individual it, students the, or the, their. The, there's a footnote to this. That's what's so curious. Footnote this. Michael Shirley now wants wants an appropriation of the university budget to hire Sleepers. private investigators to be investigating and bring charges for student protests so these kinds of exonerations don't Wait a minute, that's future. important. Sherling wants what? He, they want special police? They just, they, they just laid off a whole bunch of health workers, but he wants to hire special investigators now they have on call to investigate student activities so they can, they can, they can maintain these charges against individual students in the future. He said that this was a catastrophe because uh, the people that they had from the university, um, Lena Holcomb and, and uh, what's it, Jerome Balcom, didn't know what they were doing and doing an investigation because they weren't trained, which is probably true. I mean, if you're not trained forensically about how to present a case, you're not going to know what to do, you know. But they, they uh, as far as we know, every single student who was individually charged was found not responsible, especially including Logan Pruitt, who is a major spokesperson for SJP. And he went in and... So what are the clear. reasons that they suspend this group? What? What did they say? It's, it's obvious. Nothing. No reason. It's obvious. Right. Because they were advocating for the Palestinians, because it's verboten speech. But they don't say it. Of course they okay. never say it. Okay. Well, Bull Connor did say, if you march, I'll march you to jail. But that's not how this is practiced. Time honored position is that we have all these ostensibly neutral things, and it's just you didn't follow the bureaucratic thing, and now we have to, we have to enforce against you. That's what this is all about. This is all this is. This is old as time. This is as old as time. The Charlesworth case said, this is as old as time. Uh, Steve again. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I just have a quick question. Um, is this is your filing um, public record, and how can people get a copy of it? How can you? Oh, boy. Unless, well, I don't know. what This is federal court. I don't know what the access is to. They have a thing called PACER, P-A-C-E-R. You have to ask the court clerk about that. You may have to go up there and go <laughs> on their computer. What do you want a copy of? Of the filing, I'm going to read it. I've got case. one right here. I mean, no, 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 no. You oh, want to want to if you if you um, give why don't you do this? Send somebody, maybe Sandy, a portal, somebody a contact to send. I can send you the stuff. I've got it all electronically. I mean, this this this. I am even though I was born in the Truman administration, I am somewhat conversant in you know electronic world, and I can send the stuff out. It's, I have it as a PDF. All this stuff is a PDF. I do this because I'm old school and I like to have. I could have Tim down there. Yeah. Right, Ian. Yeah. So, since 2017, there have been a number of cases of um, students not being sanctioned for participating in protests, and those were listed. You listed many of them. Actually, I, it reminds me of 1991. There were temporary structures erected on the university green and called, they were um, designated as diversity university. Right. I remember. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember what the outcome was. But, but this issue of um, 
the, the calculus that is made in determining whether an organization would be sanctioned or not is, um, I, I think there is a, a, a calculus here being made by the university that they, they don't want protests, but as you were pointing out, some protests are taboo and others are not. And, and so, you know, this is becoming very, very evident that this is the, um, the, the, a really fundamental issue. Um, I mean, in the same way as the, the uh, Democratic Party apparently is making a calculus that by supporting Israel, they're going to lose some votes and they're going to not lose some votes. But this calculation has been made that it's apparently um, at, a, at an electoral level, it's worth continuing to support Israel, even though it's going to cost them, but the costs will be less than the benefits. Well, I also Apparently, think, I don't understand that. I, I, think mm -hmm. that, I think that they've been, I think they've been, I think the university has clearly been pressured by yeah. probably trustees and, and, and alumni. Yeah. I mean, the suspension of the poet in October on the basis mm -hmm. of nothing, totally nothing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there you, that, that's, I think, even a more uh, graphic display of what's going on here. We mentioned that. We mentioned the shooting on South, South Prospect Street, right. on, which occurred a block and a half from my house uh, on Thanksgiving weekend. I mean, all that. So that's, it's all part of the climate. And, um, you know, I mean, you think about it, and some of these protests that occurred earlier where Black Lives Matter participated, do you think UVM would dare no. in a million years to suspend mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter on campus? It would be hell to pay. I mean, it would be hell to pay. They wouldn't. They wouldn't dare to suspend me too. They wouldn't dare to suspend climate change activists. They just wouldn't dare do it. But SJP, it's different. It's different. Steve again. So this this is about an organization. No student. You're not alleging a student's rights have been. Uh, violated. This is an organizational organization's rights. But if you're a member of the organization, you can't. But, well, 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 prevent them from just calling the organization something else and reforming yeah. again and getting going to do whatever they, they want to do. Claim it's a sham and that it's really SJP and they would bring a disciplinary. We that has been discussed and. But not, couldn't you? Not going to do that. Could you argue? That's not the remedy. The remedy is to take this on head on. One of the things we did, they had a protest right when school started. And they had one of them out in front of the Royal Tyler Theater. And I said, look, you've got to be very careful. You can talk about the investigation. You can talk about the lawsuit. You can talk about how it's unconstitutional. If you want to do anything broader than that, go out on the sidewalk in front of Waterman. The sidewalk's owned by the city of Burlington, not by UVM. Do it there. I just think, I think one of the reasons this isn't moving fast is because it actually isn't affecting the rights of an individual. Oh, no, it absolutely is. They're, they're self-censorship big time, this organization. Can't organize, can't, you got freshmen, freshmen coming in, can't reach out, can't organize, can't recruit, can't do any of that. The organization cannot. Right. Well, who, who are the individuals going to recruit to? Yeah. Stephen, it's the right to associate. It's the right That's to associate. Right. It's right. the right, right. It's right. fundamental right. right to associate. Right. We are the young Democrats. We are the young Republicans. We're the young this, we're the young that, we're students for this. We are the, we are the Peace and Justice Coalition. You know, that's fundamental First Amendment right. So uh, are you arguing that, the freedom to associate? Of course. Because mm. mm. they can't join this group, nobody. Because it's not on campus anymore. So it's, it's banned, it's, it has no presence. It's as if they were a political party banned by a Latin American junta. The only difference is they're not shooting them, they're throwing their bodies in the ocean. Not but, yet. Not yet. So you keep referring to SJP, and you keep referring to Title VI. Could you explain what those are? <laughs> SJP is simply Students for Justice in Palestine. It's the, it's the acronym for UVM Students for Justice in Palestine. That's the organization. That's the organization. Right. UVM for, I, use, I use the term in the lawsuit, UVM SJP, but they use the shorthand SJP. Title VI is, I don't pretend to know a lot about it, but Title VI is a statute that says that um, there's Title VI and Title IX, and if you're getting federal money, there's certain things that you're required to do to prevent certain bad things from happening on your campus, and one of them is discriminating against, uh, discriminating against people on the basis of religion. And that's what, that's what the, that's what the uh, pro-Israeli advocates have been using to try to get 
um, the the Department of Education, and they tried it in UVM's case to crack down on advocacy, a Palestinian advocacy, claiming that. What it's, are they arguing about that? They're arguing, what you said is that, that uh, uh, criticism of, uh, any criticism of Israel and, or Zionism is, is perforce uh, anti-Semitic. It's an inherent part of the religion and therefore it's anti-religious it's anti -religious and therefore covered by Title VI. Of course, how that's going <coughs> to, how that's going to come in direct conflict with, with, uh, with the First Amendment is. Right. Don't you have but the you? problem is most, most schools don't, aren't state universities. Now, I think there's some, I don't know about the case law in there about whether they've got to adhere to First Amendment things in order to get the money. I don't know that, but that doesn't bother at least Stefanik at all. That's what she's been doing. That's, that, that's exactly what she's been up to. And, you know, by the way, University of Vermont has a, a long history of this kind of crap. Right. There was a, I forgot the guy's name. There was a, there was a, a professor at UVM in the 1950s who argued for the uh, recognition of the People's Republic of China. Of course, he was a communist sympathizer. He was out. When I went to UVM, there was a very, was a very big anti-Vietnam War uh, uh, activist, Michael Perini, who taught political science, and they canned him. Bob uh, Rice. A lot of professors are canned and on was, that. And he, was, he ran, as a footnote, he ran for... Um, he ran for U.S. Senate, U.S. House of Representatives on the Liberty Union ticket in 1974 and blew everybody's minds to get 10 or 12 percent of the vote statewide. <laughs> but he went, oh, hey, wait a minute. There's something going on in Vermont. You remember that, Peter. I remember <laughs> it, for sure. Peter. Um, are other organizations in the, in the, uh, there are other organizations in the city, members of one of them I know is, are here in the room, um, which are, have no affiliation to the university. Um, Suppose and I suppose that uh, uh, that organization were to invite some of the people who some of the students who are have been active and to one of their meetings, which could easily be held. I can think of a place quite close to the university uh, that would probably uh, provide space, uh, and they were to invite them there to start to function as part of the uh, this uh, non-university organization um, and. Uh, you know, take up the cause of, of uh, Palestinian support uh, under the auspices of an off-campus uh, non-university. Non but then, if you're an on-campus, if you're an on, if you're non, if you're an off-campus organization, you can't use the university resources. Right. Certain you can't, what? Can't use university resources to right. organize. You can't use their whatever web facilities they have. You can't use their. You can't use the Davis Center. You can't use any of that. That's the problem. And Peter, you don't fight this by trying to put on a different hat and sneaking around. You have to confront it head on. You have to say, no, 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 you can't do this. Read goddamn New York Times versus Sol Sullivan um, versus the United States. What the hell's the matter with you people? That's how you confront it. That, by the way, that's it was confronted directly that way at the University of Florida. Um, what's the governor down there? DeSantis. DeSantis. DeSantis said SJP should be outlawed as a terrorist organization. Terror terrorist organization. Uh, SJP in Florida in, uh, and uh, the, the Florida Civil Liberties Union brought suit against the Board of Regents of the University of Florida and DeSantis and said that violated the First Amendment and they backed down and they said, oh, no, no, we didn't have any plans to do any, take any, take any sanctions. That was just Ron DeSantis spewing off at the mouth and the U.S. District Court dismissed it. So they've gone after it once. I noticed that now there's a loss. I think Rutgers has brought a lawsuit. I thought Maryland. But and maybe it's Maryland. Rutgers. Rutgers didn't bring the lawsuit. Here's another one which is really disturbing with me. It, it was a great answer, by the way. And I, I really, I, yes. University, University of, take University take of Michigan. By the horns. Right. University of Michigan. They're a state university. They had an encampment out on the green. And the um, University of Michigan, sent in the goons, tore down, tore down the tents, you know, did their thing with mace and billy clubs and tear gas and injured people, sent three people in the hospital. You know what their justification was for, for uh, eliminating this tent? You ready? A fire hazard because people were cooking in hibachis and little gas grills. And my immediate reaction was, oh, the next time the University of Michigan football team has a game, home game, like they had this weekend, and they have 100,000 people there, and they're tailgating out in the parking lot, bringing the Marines. 
fire hazard, right? I mean, the level of, of, of uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Uh, if just, it's, just, it's not even hypocrisy. It's not even good. It's not even a good justification. I'm, the word escaping me. It's like mendacity, the level of mendacity for this. I mean, come, it's like that, you know, that Allstate ad where the guy, it, guy shows up yes. late from the game and hits the card. Mayhem, the guy, mayhem guy. Right. It's like, yep, we got to bring in, got to bring in, bring in, uh, who is it, the, the, the governor of New Hampshire, Sununu. Mm -hmm. So what he did at Dartmouth. He's like, he came in and brought in the goons. Busa. Is there, is there going Do you need to need a mic? This is happening across the country, you know, in all yes. universities. Yes. Is there coordination? You, we have, we are lucky to have you to do a law, uh, lawsuit. Is there coordination with other lawyers across the country? And the reason I'm asking, there is one organization that can be helpful, is uh, Palestine Legal. They have a great website, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. They, um, also, yeah. they offer resources. Yes. Yeah. They, 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 the um, SJP in Burlington has been in contact with national Good. Uh, so is there coordination between you and other lawyers across the country? There isn't even coordination internally with us yet. So one thing would step up. But there will be, maybe. There will be. There will I be. hope so. But there's also another necessity, which is funds. I'm just mentioning that. We need, you need to put it. Somebody's going to put up a GoFundMe yeah, page. Yeah, right? somebody. Need a GoFundMe we page. need donations to this court So we should, do, we should fund. I mean, yes. uh, do it on the yes. Somebody set up a GoFundMe page to do the. the well, I don't. To, right. to, or send checks somebody to needs John to, who knows how to do that needs to do that so that we can raise funds for this lawsuit. Because this is really happening. It's a. Everywhere. It's a war that is coming at us, and it has to be coordinated effort, you know, to battle it back. And uh, it's. I hope there will be coordination, and uh, if we need to fundraise, we should be doing that. Right. If anybody watch, a lot of people probably do watch Amy Goodman. She went through it like a week ago, all the censorship that's occurring on campuses. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. But, well, it's not in the little colleges that don't have mass donors. It's at the schools which have a lot of donations yeah. from rich and powerful people who support Israel's cause. But that's coordinated. You yes. Know, yes. AD, I agree. ADL I agree. and I agree. all of these donors, they are it pressuring all of these right. universities. I, I want to I tell you a story. This is Old Age Week, 19, 1972 Yom Kippur War. I was at UVM, Billings Center. And the Jewish Defense League was there. They, I don't even know that it's even in existence anymore. And they were claiming at that time is exactly the same thing, that any criticism is, of Israel was anti-Semitic. Right. And that was what they were, that was either loud and strong. That was their argument back then. That was 52 years ago. You know, so. Oh, yeah, this has been going on for a long time. Eric, back there. Yes. My first question was, I mean, I don't know if it was partially answered, but if it was a private university, right. would you tackle the issue differently? I don't know if you could tackle you the issue. You can't. Okay. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if you could ta ta tackle it. You might have to try to do it through Title Seven, or Title Six. I mean, but you wouldn't have the same. All this stuff, all this case law, all that, it doesn't apply. That's, the, that's, that's, that's why... You know, when I saw this suspension, I, my first reaction was, how could UVM be so stupid? And which is why I wanted to sit down with them in the summer and say, how could you be so stupid? You know, they're away, they're away now. They're going to come back. Uh, the, the university president is leaving. He's going to Arizona, turn over a new leaf. Nope. Nope. Which is why I think that they're, I think they're hedging their bets here. I think they're, I think the university feels they're in a no-lose situation. If they lose this lawsuit, then they've inoculated themselves against a Title VI claim. I, that's a, a private theory that I have, but I think that maybe was probably going right on. though. So they're question. going, they're going like, "Hey, fine, sue us." I'm glad you did. <laughs> Second question will, you know, pull us a little bit out of, you know, the universities and see the country, you know, as a whole. You know, like, do you think that uh, uh, the problem on the university are, you know, a symptom? of a bigger problem in this country where, you know, uh, the justice system is losing any credibility? No. Is, is, the, is it? No. 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 <laughs> no, but wait a minute. I, I... Because, you know, I mean, the past years, me, I mean, I, I, I see people bragging about choosing a Supreme Court, you know, uh, 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 personality. I mean, 
I mean, uh, a, a student in law would be, you know, really baffled by all this, you know, like... I think, though, that... Not if you study the history of the U.S. Supreme Court. No. It's not baffling at all. Yeah, yeah but, but, you know, but what he's, I think what he's trying to say is that we're not necessarily talking about the justice system right now. What we're talking about is universities across this country are censoring pro-Palestinian, end the war, protests. Those are universities. We don't really know what's going to happen in the courts. So we're not, so this case tonight is against the university, and we're hoping that the courts will be fair. Now, whether or not they're fair is going to be a different matter. But he cited many cases, Eric, that do protect free speech. For instance, when you talk about desecrating the flag, when I was in the legislature, there were constant attempts to make flag burning outlawed. However, it wasn't ever outlawed because the Supreme Court said that you can desecrate the flag. This is free speech. So the courts have often protected free speech. But right now, the threat is from the universities that are censoring everything. Everybody's censoring everything, including the media, too. And it's all about Palestine. Yep. But it's not necessarily the universities only. If you look around the country, yeah, you know, right. I mean, states. We we mentioned the name of uh, of uh, uh, like a governor of uh, a southern country. I mean, uh, Florida. The the like, same. there's so much. To, it, does it mean that you know something is failing? Because for someone to be able to suspend a student or a student yeah. organization so bluntly. It means that they are being inv invigorating by, you know, something that's going on. Either the political situation, you know, because there's, I mean, I, I wanted to see the link between, you know, the political, oh, you know, atmosphere and all this. Bet your bottom dollar that threats were made that if so something wasn't done about mm -hmm. this, certain donations wouldn't be exactly, forthcoming. Exactly, that's anymore. what the. That's exactly what the name of the game is. is. It, that's, that's, that's. Don't even need a These universities are funded by donations by rich people. But is it also a problem that education be only under donations? No. Is there any uh, um, uh, 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 constitutional right to education, for example? No. Not on a not university, university level. Not on a can university we, level. Can we be proud of being a nation that does, doesn't have a, and then be so be be surprised that you know? There's a lot of or whatever security guard on the, There's a lot the of reasons here. not to be proud of the United States, but there's a lot of reasons to be proud of the United okay. States. The main one to me is the Bill of Rights. I I heard many elements on the case from you tonight, but I I didn't hear about the practice UVM through the 10 days what they did. I mean, there is an element that says the UVM are suspending the club. The reason because they were afraid of something bad will happen, you know, that the club or the members of the club, they were, their intention is to do harm to the property or uh, whatever activism. But I didn't hear the opposite, like through the 10 days, what UVM did to the students. The harm inflicted by the institution by putting uh, uh, highlights, cameras in every yep. corner, intimidation, yep. Yep. scaring that. many students, mainly Palestinian origin students and Arab students, Muslim students who are in F1 visa, uh -huh. who are not American, that yep. they couldn't join the activism of the Student for Justice in Palestine. Yep. Right. They were trying their best to show solidarity, but at the same time to stay on the sideline yep. because they will lose their status. Yep. Uh, the intimidation by uh, the chief of police. Right. Yep coming again and again with the threats. And the history of the chief of police, by the way, he is uh, trained on Israel with the deadly exchange. His name is existed. He sold and became salesman for software for uh, uh, many institutions, uh, 
practically to spy on in the situation that made in Israel, product made in Israel, and he came back later to become a chief of police. In uh, Burlington, again, you're talking about? For the second time. Wait, you wait, know? wait. Could I, could I ask, are you referring to Michael Sherling, head of security at yes. UVA? Okay, not Murad. No, no. Sherling. The chief okay. of police of UVM. Okay, right. And not only him, he went on the uh, trips invited by the IDF and others. The, uh, wow. the chief of police before him, she was a woman. She went on the same uh, trip, you know, which is a training a trip right. to, yeah. Well, so that's a, that's wow. there is a lot of harm happened to our students on the campus, you know, that didn't happen on the private uh, colleges in you uh, on Vermont, like Middlebury or Sterling, you know. As a matter of fact, the only opposition in Middlebury from the campus uh, administration was you cannot make the green as alternative university as the students intended because they invited speaker after speaker to educate the public about labor struggle, student struggle, you know, liberation uh, movement uh, around the world. Uh, this is what they opposed to. But in general, they didn't uh, suspend them. They didn't threaten of suspending them. Yeah, well, you got to understand, though, when I have a lawsuit like this, it can't be, it can't be a it can't be a stew of stuff. We've got to focus on the harm to the, to the plaintiffs, which are these students. So what was the harm to them? You know, we do talk about what you're talking about. Is, it's called a chilling effect. That's the legal term. It's, it, 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 um, chills. It chills. It makes, it makes, it, 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 it makes people fearful of associating with. We put that, we put that right in the front of the, uh, I'll tell you what I wrote. Uh, the very first paragraph, in a word, as a state university, the defendants have invoked state power to muzzle UVM SJP, to delegitimize de it, and give anyone else second thoughts about associating with it, which is exactly what you've just talked about. And that's exactly what they were up to. And they, the, you know, the, the, the students talked about this. Well, that was the other absurdity. We brought that out in the suit, too. They had this thing, and it was a solar. It was this camera. It was a security camera. And they were doing security. They're saying it's heard as it's like now four months later, five months later. They haven't done an investigation. They had this damn camera on for ten days. They don't have. A, they don't have evidence of an investigation of what went on there. I mean, come on, it's it's all baloney. Well, um, can you subpoena anything they have sure. on? Yeah. Not yes. Yes. Fundraise. It's, yeah, but you're talking about you know. I have limited time and resources. I'm not a 50-person you know, law firm here. This isn't like... That's why coordination is really important. Well, that's why fundraising in this thing is going to be really important because this is, I haven't even got what the UVM is going to throw at us yet. That's going to happen in a week or two. Okay, this should be an ongoing effort, but, you know, we're reaching uh, the time uh, limit, and so maybe we'll take one other question from Ian. But wait a minute, I just want to say one other thing. I mean it about fundraising. I know what it costs to do a, fun, uh, yes. to do a lawsuit. This is going to be a nationally known lawsuit. It has to be done correctly. Franco, John Franco is a single practitioner, so please think about donating your time and money to his law firm. You need to set up a website. Right. A group. But I don't Go know how to do that. Does to anybody do that. know how to do you that? You have to recruit somebody. What? You have to recruit somebody who knows how to I know. Do. So, I, okay. Hey, Tim, can you do it? Okay, this is my assistant, Tim Galloway. That's what's going to happen. Can you really do Okay, we'll do, we can do, try to do, do that online. tomorrow. Okay? Do okay? All right. And then what happens is then you set up a fund where that collects the money and then the, then the money... Somebody said, why don't I do it? No, 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 way. no, 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 and not me either. But we have to also do events like this. Hey, but how about Kalia too? But Kalia's our, maybe, I'm hoping, Kalia Livingston back there might be our four-year clerk in my office. Uh, anyway, Kalia is a very bright, intelligent young woman who I hope will become a lawyer. Anyway, Musa. You know, I just want to stress this is a coordinated effort right. across the country attacking all universities and you see their uh, excuses or oh, safety and all of that it's all being fed by somebody by some source it's so, a playbook it's look at it's it nothing, is a playbook it's a playbook 
But we really, we, like Palestine Legal, I hope somebody can reach out because they are connected across the country. No, it's already happened. It's trying to, yeah. yeah, I really hope because it's coordinated effort and we have to have a coordinated effort back. And uh, thank you, you are in the spearhead of this uh, effort. He is. Yeah? I but think his is the first lawsuit that has been filed. Is that correct? No, the University, University of Florida was the first one. Was the first one? Okay. the first one. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. But, but, other, but, other, but it's been disappointing. It's like uh, they suspended uh, SJP again, and I Where? think at Rutgers. Mm. And they didn't do anything about it. Well, yeah. we're going to do something about it. Anyway, thank you. Okay, so with that, his office is 110 Main Street, 05401. So send checks, okay? No, anyway. don't. Send up, set up a fund and have the funds okay, in here. All right, okay. I don't do this ad hoc, Sandy. All please. right, please. I just so got I'm, Tim so to I'm, do it. I'm Ian Stokes and I maintain the website for Vermonters for Justice in Palestine. It's vtjp.org. And there's a panel right at the top of the main page which is about this case and it gives information about how to donate to a legal su support fund for the. For the uh, for the case. We need something more specific, more concrete. No, we did. Need, Tim just got said he would do a GoFundMe, okay, we need, right? We need, you need to do a GoFundMe page, <laughs> and you need, you need to organize among, you need to really get the wit message out at UVM, you get among the faculty, among the staff. I mean, a lot of the a lot of the things that went on there were, were the staff unions that came in and, and organized and protested and spoke. They said, oh, well, you know, uh, this isn't really, a, this isn't really a, a, a public forum. Well, outside the Davis Center, they have a public, they have an outside stage. Literally a stage that overlooks the green, where people—that's where—that's where a lot of these uh, these uh, these these protests and speeches were held. It's just. Uh, Can I say one other word? Yeah. Um, I also want to thank the law school. Uh, Jared Carter is a professor at this uh, great new law space um, at Vermont, Vermont uh, Law School, which now has a Burlington space, which is this space. Its main school is in South Royalton. Jared was the person who was able to arrange the use of this space, so I want to thank him and the law school for hosting this. Um, remember that this is a free speech place, and I believe that that is, oh, and the, the new pre president of Vermont Law School gave a great presentation. I guess Grant saw that uh, at the, L the Enrichment Education Series, mm -hmm. in which he pledged that Vermont Law School would be a center for free speech activities and respect for the First Amendment. That's very unusual these days. In and uh, issued you know. a major uh, email release right. September 19th. He didn't mention us in substance, but in substance supporting our position here. Yes. So we'll thank the law school and Jared also. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think mean, that's really important to say, you know, to UVM, you know, we got VLS in our community. I don't call it VLS anymore. VL and what? VL. VLGS. And I think the, the, the heart of what the what the law school has said it really gets to the critical and fundamental components of the First Amendment, which is to protect speech regardless of the message, regardless of the content. And while private institutions like Vermont Law School don't have to comply with the First Amendment, when they internally take that position, I think it sends a really powerful message about what the I, values are. I, I, you know, I, I got to tell you, I mean, I went to UVM during the anti-war movement, and I'm like, mm -hmm. Ed Andrews was president. He was he was a physician, and he, you know, and he, poor Ed Andrews, he was from Plainfield, Vermont. And at that time, we called him a fascist. You know, oh, good God. He was Who not. Was that? Ed Andrews was the UVM president. We could protest. We did everything. They didn't care. As long as we weren't burning the campus down, they left us alone, you know? <laughs> There were a lot. There were quite a few occupies, though, weren't there? At, not, not when not in my. Well, there was in, one in solidarity with South Africa. Remember that? Not, not when I went there. But, that was well, not well when we went there, but there. later. Great. Okay, Thank so if anybody gets in trouble with all these protests, you can call me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.